So it's great to be in uh, Krakow again. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the work I'm going to tell you about is um, follows on uh, from Garrett's talk in some way. So I was very excited to see Garrett uh, talking this morning about uh, patterns and bouncing squirrels. I think what I'm going to say in this talk is going to uh, follow on a bit from that. Sadly, I don't have any bouncing squirrels to show you. That's fine. If you want to know more about our research, uh, please uh, go to our Twitter feed. Here are my details. I'll pass them on at the end of the uh, talk as well. And there are web pages where you can learn more about the work we're doing on the project. So the work here is based on two European projects, one called Paraphrase that involves uh, various partners from uh, AGH and other places uh, throughout Europe. We have 13 partners uh, from eight countries. And what we're looking at is parallel patterns uh, for heterogeneous multicore systems. So I say Garrett's talk was appropriate, I really meant it. And I am coordinating this project for my sins. It comes to an end uh, in about two months' time. Also, uh, a new project, Rephrase, and this is uh, slightly different. It's refactoring uh, parallel heterogeneous software. And what we're proposing to do is to look at all the software engineering issues uh, that people have said are important, uh, but which have basically been neglected. And I'll explain to you a bit uh, what I mean by refactoring. Chris Brown this afternoon will give you uh, some technical details about the refactoring process that we're using. We think it's a very powerful mechanism in combination uh, with pattern-based approaches to dealing with parallel software. And I'll show you uh, that later. Very pleased to have taken functional programming out into the camp of the enemy in the form of, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say enemy, um, friends like IBM uh, and other large software uh, companies. Um, I'm afraid that we're looking at C++ in this uh, project. That's pragmatic. I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, later on. But there's a reason for doing this. But bear in mind that I am a Haskell guy, uh, so whatever I have to do, whatever I'm doing, ultimately has to do with functional programming. And we're working with a lot of industry. So here are a few of our industrial connections. So this is very hot from an industrial perspective. So let me give you some basic motivation. Well, multi-core is now ubiquitous. Even this little device that I'm presenting on at the front here is a multi-core system. How many uh, cores does my laptop have? Or audience question. Two, four, eight, One. 16. All oh, right. <laughs> Sorry, seven. <laughs> OK. I, I like your thinking. 42, 42. Let me tell you. Yeah, so it's got two x86 CPU cores. I'm afraid Apple don't put quad cores into these devices. But maybe that's really four, because we have, have hyper-threading. Okay, so it's sort of four, or maybe two, depending how you count them. Oh, and I have 12 GPUs. Nobody thought about the GPUs. So I have 12 GPU execution units. These are all cores. They're very specialized. They're specialized cores, but they are definitely cores. I have two HD video encoders. Okay? Uh, these, I think, are made by ARM. They're cores. They're processor cores. They only do one thing. Very specialized, very dedicated. I have a Bluetooth controller. If you look inside that, you discover there's a processor which is just dedicated uh, to dealing with Bluetooth. I have a disk controller for my SSD. I have a power management unit, which is more powerful than the very first computer that I programmed. And all it's doing is figuring out, should we turn on or off this device? And so on and so forth. So altogether, this little device sitting down here has about 20 cores in it of various types. Okay? This trend is going to uh, increase. So today, you can buy one of these devices, an Intel Xeon Phi. This was released in 2013. It has 60 cores. Um, you'll notice that they're not running 60x86 cores. Sadly, they're only running at about 1.2 gigahertz. One of the big trades at the moment is between processor speed and the number of cores. And with the Xeon Phi, Intel have gone down the, let's have lots of cores, but they won't, we won't run them very fast. Does anyone know why? Temperature? No. Power? Synchronization between Syn cores. Synchronization between cores. Power consumption. Power consumption. Yeah, these, these are all good answers. These are all good answers. Fundamentally, I think the issue is power or energy. You'll see down here, I put a little number, 300 watts, okay? 
Now, that's quite a lot of power, quite a lot of energy to draw. If I had that in my laptop, I wouldn't go very far with it. I certainly wouldn't have it on my lap, I can tell you. <laughs> far too power hungry, far too energy intensive. If these things were running at 3 gigahertz, it wouldn't be consuming 300 watts. It would be consuming 1.2 kilowatts, maybe 2 kilowatts of energy. Now, that is basically the same as a heating system. I definitely don't want that to be carrying around as a portable device. So energy fundamentally limits the speed at which uh, cores can run. Lower uh, speed uh, chips uh, can run at um, lower energy consumption. This is the future. The future is keeping the clock speed down whilst increasing probably the number of cores. So what about the future? Well, what I confidently predict, based on drawing a straight line between my two-core laptop and the 60-core Xeon Phi, is that in a very few number of years, we will have devices which have hundreds of thousands or millions of cores, probably very low power. And I'm calling this megacore. Does anyone here have Wikipedia editing rights? Good. Could you credit me with that, please? <laughs> I want my name to go down in history. So what do megacore systems look like? Well, they are going to be uh, nodes that are linked to the system. Each node is going to perhaps have several large CPU cores, plus specialist many-core accelerators, things like the Xeon Phi's. Uh, a highly heterogeneous processor structure, some of which we can access, like the GPUs, CPUs on this device, some of which are going to be dedicated that we won't really be able to program very easily. But they'll all be capabilities that we have available uh, to us. Um, high performance network to link the nodes, probably not much memory per core. And XCL systems in particular, these really large scale systems, are going to be highly heterogeneous. Now, that's very exciting. What I'm now showing you is going to be incredibly frightening, particularly if you're not a functional programmer. Because these devices will probably not have shared memory. Okay? Remember those big arrays that we used to have? Well, they're not going to work very well on this class of machine. The uh, myth that we have access uniformly at the same speed uh, to memory uh, across a high-performance computing system, probably even a low-performance computing system, is just going to go away. So anyone who is today thinking, well, the best way to program is by setting up a huge great array and using shared memory to access that, I'm afraid is going to come up against a brick wall very, very shortly. Let me show you this. This is the fastest computer in the world. Does anyone know what this is? No? Sorry? Blue G now, no. That's a good, good guess. Yes, Chinese. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the Tian2. And by the way, this changes. So from day to day, what is actually the fastest does change. But when I Googled it, this was what was the fastest. So Tian2 from the Chinese National uh, University of Defense Technology. Uh, any idea what they're doing with that? No, don't, don't tell me. <laughs> 33.86 petaflops per second. So in the high performance world, people think in terms of floating point operations per second. 33.86 petaflops. What's more interesting to me is that it has 16,000 nodes. Each of them has two 16-core uh, Ivy Bridge uh, multi-cores and three of those Xeon finds that I showed you. It's a very common pattern. If you do the numbers, if you do the math, as the Americans say, uh, you work out that this has 3.3 uh, 3 million 120,000 x86 cores in total. Okay, so mega core is not that far fetched. Okay, today if you've got a machine like this, you need to be the Chinese government and you need to build a small nuclear power station perhaps to power it. But in the future, uh, I confidently predict that this kind of technology, probably not quite on that scale, will be coming to a laptop or desktop near you. And exascale computers uh, take this out uh, from these kind of figures. So what people are projecting is going to be the future in high performance computing. It's going to be maybe 33 times faster than what I've just shown you. And that's what people are confidently predicting will be in place by about 2020, about maybe 2025. So 33 times the power of a machine like the one I just showed you. 
available to do whatever you want, really, if you can afford it, and the energy budget. So, mega cool, I think. <laughs> or maybe mega hot is a better word. Because... Uh, if you think about Raspberry Pi, the second edition, yes. which has four cores, and it's actually quite cheap, and you can... Yeah. Uh, it's not that power hungry. That's right. So we, we're, seeing, we're seeing an onslaught from both directions. At the top end, you're seeing these really, really powerful machines, lots and lots of cores. And at the bottom end, you're seeing things like Raspberry Pi, uh, other cheap commodity processors. I'll show you one or two of those. Um, essentially using the same technology. So at the low end, what we're seeing is multiple cores used to keep the energy usage down. And in the best cases, uh, this can be maybe less than five watts of power. Okay? That's very exciting. One of my colleagues, uh, also from Poland, is working on devices which are printed onto paper. Wait, so you print the circuitry onto the paper, uh, you print a battery onto the paper, this is solar powered, these devices run for a few years on that battery charge before you have to reprint them. That's seriously cool. <laughs> so energy usage scales linearly with the number of cores, so the more cores you add, uh, the more power you get, pretty obvious. But as you increase the clock frequency, so the uh, power usage squares with the cube of the clock frequency. And this is really what's driving the move towards uh, more cores, uh, but lower speed. So here's a little graph just to show that. And if you carry this up, okay, this was done in, I think, 2000 and something. Uh, what they predicted was, well, by 2006, you'd be... Uh, basically have the energy density of a nuclear reactor in your laptop. And by 2010 or thereabouts, we'd be having the energy density of uh, a rocket nozzle in a laptop if we just kept scaling the uh, energy usage. And that's why we've got multi-core. Okay. Luckily, I don't have a rocket in this. Fuel cells, great. Just not in my laptop. So it's not just about large systems. Uh, even mobile phones are multi-core. Even... Devices like the one I've got here, a multi-core. Um, and in particular, the Samsung, Samsung Exynos 5 Octa, this has eight cores. And five, at any point in time, four of them are dark. They're not powered. This is another trend. We'll have lots of capability, but we're just not going to be able to afford to power it up all the time. We're going to have to be selective. So we need to use the cores when we need the boost, and not all the time. If we don't solve this challenge, then we're just not going to be able to keep on making progress in computer science. So it's a problem that everyone, uh, every programmer, every developer here is going to have to face at some point, probably pretty soon. If you don't start to think multi-core, and then beyond that, many-core, mega-core, then your software is just going to stop working. It's going to hit a brick wall. There's only so far that the hardware architects can stretch existing technology. And that point, I'm afraid, Looks like it's going to happen pretty soon from all the current trends. <coughs> so all future programming is going to be parallel. So this is the future, guys. This is why it's research. So welcome to the future. Here's another little device just to show you uh, what's happening uh, at the moment. Uh, this is something called, it's an NVIDIA Tegra K1, just been announced. Uh, it has four fast uh, cores, this bi big little uh, kind of architecture, one slower, low-power A15 core. Basically, you can switch between them. So you can go between the high-power ones or the lower-power ones as you need. So as with the Samsung, you can use the uh, four low-power devices when you don't need much energy. You know, you're reading email, you're uh, doing a spreadsheet, whatever. And then when you need the performance boost, uh, when you're playing Angry Birds, something like that, then you can switch to the higher power, higher energy devices for a short period of time. It's got 192 core Kepler uh, GPU, 2 gigs of RAM, and this is an exciting development. This is shared between the CPU and the GPU. One of the big problems at the moment is that if we have uh, code running on the CPU, we have to offload the data from the CPU to the GPU, get, do the computations on the GPU, get the results back. Sharing between CPU and GPU on one of these chips dramatically shortens that path, makes the exploitation of a GPU much easier. 
And I predict these things are going to be the near-term future. They're starting to emerge, so-called APUs. Um, so I, you can buy these um, now uh, in various devices, but I think these are going to become very, very common in the very near future. So you will have to program using GPUs. How many people have done that? Few. How many people are still sane of those who've done it? One or two. Good. <laughs> GPU programming at the moment is a test of anyone's patience and, and general sanity. It is very, very hard. Vladimir will tell us this afternoon exactly how hard when he tells us about our Lapido uh, heterogeneous uh, system. And this thing consumes one to five peak power watts, peak power usage. Very, very impressive. Costs about $100. You can buy a development kit for something like $100 for one of these things. So affordable, cheap, affordable, high performance. Dark silicon, I've mentioned, important trend. Go over to the dark side. Don't power all the silicon at one point. Um, turn off CPUs, turn off GPUs, whatever you're not using for a computation. And power them up when you need to. So when you need to deal with uh, a large computation. And in some designs, you can predict that actually what's going to happen in the future is that we won't be moving uh, data through uh, to the pressing units. What we're doing is power lighting up pressing units that are near the data. So we're passing computation perhaps between data items rather than passing the data between compute items. So you may be thinking completely differently at the architectural level just to keep the uh, total energy usage heat dissipation down to sensible levels. So expect to see some really crazy designs come up in the near term. Uh, hopefully mostly hidden to the programmer. But say I've got a mega core. Well, doesn't that mean millions of threads on such uh, a computer? Well, yes. Here's a little example. It's a real program, test program. I don't know if you can read the number down there. Let me read it out to you. Uh, 331-161-522. Don't try to phone that. It's not a phone number. This is a number of threads that this program has created in about four and a half seconds of execution. I'll let that sink in for a second. That's a lot. This has been done deliberately as a test. I'm actually running this program on uh, an eight-core machine. You can't see all the cores here. Each of these is a graph of one of the cores. You can see they're pretty active. We're getting about a factor of eight uh, utilization of the cores. It's quite a good uh, allocation. Okay? So how have I done that? Is this magic? Well, of course it's magic. If you're trying to do this, using uh, something like a conventional Java or pthreads approach, I'm afraid this probably wouldn't work particularly well. I've seen systems with a few thousand threads. They tend to grind to a standstill on the very latest uh, equipment. It just doesn't work. The trick is this is written in Haskell, parallel Haskell. It's a test bed uh, program, something we've been working on, or I've been working on now for about 20 years, in fact. Uh, so we're quite proud of this technology. But basically, the trick is to have this parallelism available so that if we have a mega core machine, we can soak it up. But then to actually utilize uh, a much smaller set of the available parallelism to basically match the parallelism that's available to the architecture. So we've actually created only 20,000 threads. Okay? Still a lot. But we have incredibly lightweight threading. And therefore, we can cope with that. And that is a trick. Minimize the overhead get the uh, parallelism overhead down as little as possible, then you can deal with a lot of threads, but then do match the work to the system. Don't just take what the program has given you, because if you've got too much, you're going to be swamped. Alternatively, if you have too little, you're not going to keep the device active. You've got to, get, you've got to have more than enough to keep an arbitrary system active to get good scalability, but you then need to match it to your system resources, and that's the trick. I've written lots of papers on this, Ask me later if you're interested in some of those papers. So what are we trying to achieve? Well, uh, this is just to show you what parallelism and concurrency is all about. Here is the theory. We have uh, lots of uh, cute little puppies lining up at their bowls to eat. Uh, here's the practice. 
And what we're trying to do is to make the practice more like the theory, so that the cute little puppies are actually lined up by the right balls, and we've got to get a good, efficient schedule. So let me digress and tell you about how to build a wall. Okay? Very therapeutic, by the way. If you happen to have a few odd moments, wall building is a great uh, exercise. Winston Churchill used to do it, apparently. So I was at a conference uh, a few years back with Ian Watson, who's a data flow guy, or the data flow guy, if you like. And Ian said, well, that's all very well, having these millions of um, threads. But you know, some problems uh, just aren't like that. Some things are necessarily sequential. And being an academic, I like a challenge. So I said, well, OK, and yeah, like what? And he said, well, building a wall. No, you have to place a brick and another one and another one and so on. Okay, now I've got a layer of bricks. And then we can do the same with the second row of bricks. Now I've got the second row. And now we do the third one and we've built a wall. And that is purely sequential. You have to place the first brick and then the second one and so on. Everyone agree? No. <laughs> Good. Some people have programmed in parallel before. So let's imagine we have uh, several brick layers, OK? Uh, so here I've got four brick layers. Uh, these are going to be highly efficient Polish brick layers. <laughs> no laughing, please. <laughs> so how can we build a wall faster using our four brick layers? Well, you can lay some bricks at the same time, some more bricks at the same time. Now I've built the first row. More bricks, more bricks, another set, and we've built the wall. The wall is exactly the same, but now I've built it in parallel by breaking the problem down into these bricks. How much faster was that? <laughs> Cynic. No, no, you have to calculate, you have to calculate, it's not a good example, you have to calculate the distance between. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's assume that we live in a perfect world. We're, we're, I'm an academic. This is research. <laughs> I can do that. There is no overhead. Everything is perfect. If everything is perfect, how much faster is that? We have a theory. The theory is puppets are alive. Theory of the puppets are alive. Practice is a little harder. But I'll show you the practice as well. Sorry? Four times. four times. Everyone think it's four times? Who thinks it's four times? Raise your hand. Have the courage of your convictions. In a perfect world. More, more than four times? Good. People are paying attention. Uh, any other number? Two times? Three times? A bit more than three? A few of you? Okay. Let's work it out. Theory is always easy to work out. Oh, so I placed three bricks. So I'm not going to get a factor of four. And another three bricks. Still three. Four? So that's a bit more than three. Another three, still a bit more than three. Another three, and a final three. So using four brick layers, I, c I still can't get uh, a speed up of a factor of four, because the problem decomposition doesn't let me do that. Okay? So even if you put more resources onto a problem, it doesn't necessarily run faster. You have to match the uh, amount of work uh, to the availability of the workers. So the correct answer is about 3.1 in a perfect world or in a real world, ho hopefully more than one. <laughs> Let me show you how not to build a wall. You place a brick, you place another brick, you place another brick, and you keep going. And now we have a wall. Okay? Now, theoreticians, please note, this wall is isomorphic to the original one. <laughs> These are exactly the same wall. You can see that just by inspecting the diagram. But it doesn't work. You know, it's total nonsense in practice. Why, why is that? Gravity. Gravity. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Newton is not in the audience. I've ignored a fundamental dependency. This brick here relies on the bricks underneath it to support it, and so on throughout the structure. Okay. If I ignore that dependency, then this is not going to work. 
And this again is true for parallel programming. I can't place these bricks, I can't execute this parallel task until I have executed these ones. So figuring out what are the necessary dependencies, what is going to make my wall stand up, is absolutely fundamentally essential to getting good parallel execution. And luckily, function programming helps us do that. So task identification, the bricks, not the only problem. We also have to worry, of course, about things like coordination, uh, who does what, uh, communication, making sure that the brickies speak to each other uh, so they don't get their fingers in the wrong place, uh, placement, which brick is put where, uh, exchange lane, which order do the bricks get laid in, and so on and so forth. Can, can anyone see a better way of doing that? Can anyone get a, more than a factor of three speed up from this problem? Yeah. So if I flip the bits. Oh, left on the ground. Yeah, yeah. That's, a good, that's a good answer. What I said to you is um, there are some fundamental dependencies. Okay? The ultimate problem has to respect those dependencies. But as you're building it up, maybe you can break some of those dependencies. So there are real dependencies and there are accidental dependencies. Getting a good parallel solution involves respecting the dependencies that are necessary, but breaking the ones that are not. So for example, that brick has to uh, rest on these two, but it doesn't have to rest on those. So as soon as I place these two, I can place that one. I don't have to build the complete wall to complete there as I showed you. And you can also do things like prefabrication if the dependencies are accidental. And uh, guys, if you're using concurrency approaches, I'm afraid you have to solve all this stuff. I don't think this is a good move for a mega core system. We need structure, we need abstraction, we don't need another brick in the wall. What we need to do is to think in parallel, new high-level programming constructs allowing us to deal with hundreds of millions of threads, as I showed you. So we should be capable as, as programmers of dealing with that. Uh, we shouldn't be mucking around with things like deadlocks. Okay? Uh, some very, very clever people trying to solve uh, problems of deadlock detection. It's a bit like curing cancer. Okay? It's great to cure cancer, but personally, I'd rather not have it in the first place. And that's what deadlock is. You cannot program effectively while fiddling with communication, etc. If, if you're playing around with communication structures, you're thinking at far too low a level. You should be thinking at the level of the brick layer, how do you place things at the level of the tasks, not thinking, oh, I've got to communicate between this thread and that thread, and so on. And this is a bit frightening for the modern generation. You have to think about performance. Okay? For the last 20 years, People have basically been ignoring real performance information. They've had abstract models that help them with the programs. This is OK, because all architectures have basically been the same. But in the future, they won't be. We will have to start thinking again about performance information, integrating this into our design. Big shift back to the past. Okay? And hopefully, we can do this in a way which is high level and abstract. So solution, well, according to Bob Harper, the only solution, the only thing that works for parallelism is functional programming. I'm an academic. You can verify this. The citation is Bob Harper's Facebook page. <laughs> so, nice thing about parallel functional programming. Purity means no side effects. Lots of advantages. Easy to find parallelism. Impossible for parallel processes to interfere with each other. We get a nice breakdown. Clean, simple bricks. We can debug sequentially, but run in parallel. And that gives us an enormous saving in programmer effort. My colleagues will tell you a bit about that later on. Uh, you can concentrate on solving the problem, not on putting some uh, sequential algorithm into some vaguely parallel system. There are no locks, deadlocks, or race conditions, okay? which means there are huge productivity gains. You can actually deal with these parallel programs with huge numbers of threads. So I, Brett definitely recommend uh, parallel function programming. I'm going to skip this one. It's a bit short of time, but it's basically to say, uh, if you're used to concurrency, guys, parallelism is kind of the opposite. So parallelism is the reality. Concurrency is an illusion. So the bricks, of course, are functional. A brick is a function in some sense. Also, also known as a closure. So in parallel Haskell, what I can say is, let's define a brick to be some expression that I want to calculate. 
And then what I can say is, let's execute the brick in parallel with the main computation. What that's going to do is set up a future, a little marker, which is not a real thread, but something that I could execute in the future if I need more work. And if you've got a strict language, okay, uh, sorry guys, uh, you're a bit behind the times, but if you do have a strict language like Erlang or Scala, then you can mimic the effect using conditionals or function applications. So you can, you can get some of the benefits of things like futures, et cetera, in strict languages as well. But you may have to program by setting up a function instead and then passing in some dummy argument. It's a bit clumsy, I know, but you get some of the advantages of laziness that way. I'll put my slides online later so you'll be able to get them. So the paraphrase approach is to start bottom up, identify uh, strongly hygienic components, bricks. So by strongly hygienic, I mean things that may not be completely pure, but which don't have unwanted interactions with each other. <laughs> Think about the pattern of parallelism. And these can be things like maps. We're all familiar with maps, um, folds, reduces in our uh, functional programs. These are good patterns, and they often lead to good parallel implementations. Structure them into a parallel program using a concrete skeleton to do that, taking into account things like performance, energy, etc., usage, and then do it again until you get it right. And the putting it into the right form and the doing it again is going to involve refactoring the code. Okay? So Chris Brown this afternoon will tell us about that for both legacy and new programs. So here's our approach. Start with our sequential code, Erlang, Haskell, Scala, F-sharp. Insert your favorite language here. Put it through a sausage factory, sausage machine, per sausage machine. Crank the handle. So I'm going to take my patterns in on one side. I'm going to have my pattern machine, my sausage machine, cranking out the parallel programs at the bottom. Um, taking into account costing or profiling information. Then I get a parallel program in terms of Erlang, Haskell, Scala, etc. So I'm afraid if you give me Erlang, you'll still get Erlang out. Uh, if you give me Haskell, you'll still get Haskell out. We're not quite that clever. That's an approach that's not automatic. Right? It's semi-automatic. Systematic. Systematic, yes. Chris, Chris Van will tell you about the precise mechanism later this afternoon. Uh, essentially, what we have is uh, a system which is tool-based, which is programmer-directed, which aids the programmer to introduce the parallelism. So it guides the programmer. And Tamash, I think, will show us um, some more automatic ways of directing the programmer towards the patterns that are best. Okay? So what we think is the programmer should be helped. Um, but if you want to get maximum impact, um, completely replacing the programmer isn't effective. If you use our tool um, and it introduces the parallels, and that's great, but if things change in the future, how do you deal with it yourself again? So you want to help the programmer. That's, that's right. That's, that's right. So the, the idea is to keep the programmer in the loop, to take advantage of programmer expertise when they're available, to guide the programmer, to train the programmer to do the right thing. In the long term, we might be able to do things fully, automatic, fully automatically, but I think we're still a little way off that at this point in time. And then we go down to our um, heterogeneous hardware. So common patterns can include things like uh, farms, uh, maps, pipelines, divide and conquer, reduce, etc. You've probably come across these terms uh, before uh, in other settings. Let's explain some of them. So a pipeline, you're basically doing one thing after the other. A uh, very common pattern that we discover in our programs, uh, particularly in a functional program, at the top level. You, in the programs I write in Haskell, I tend to do something like read input and then do something and then do something else series of phases. That's a pipeline. If you have laziness, you can make that parallel. Or if you can break the dependencies, you can make that parallel. A map, applying the same operation over a list or other collection structure, uh, basically all the operations can go in parallel. A reduce or a fold, basically a tree cascade, uh, applying the operation between the elements of data at, at a time. And a farm is interesting. Because what a farm is, it looks very similar to, to a map. If you look at my structure here, you'll think these are the same pattern. At some level of abstraction, they are. The difference is that with the farm, 
what I'm going to have is a fixed number of workers. Then I'm going to work out how to allocate data items to those workers. Maybe there's one worker per core in my system. Whereas with the map, there'll be one worker per data item. So a lot, a lot more potential parallelism. And this can be a very effective way of taking something which is, which is highly parallel today and putting it onto a system which has a relatively few number of cores. Because the number of workers, the number of uh, agents that are actually doing the work is quite small. It can be quite small. 8, 16, 32, something of that order. Great. And of course, these can be combined. Uh, you've heard, all heard of Google's MapReduce, presumably. just combines two of these patterns, in effect. So think about the patterns. These things are functional. So higher order functions can capture parallel patterns. So for example, we can find a parallel map in Haskell, basically to be a map operation where we spark off the computation in parallel with the main body at each point. And then to build the bricks, all I have to do is to apply the parallel map over the operation which is creating the brick to all my inputs. Now I've got a parallel program. Wasn't that easy? And that is basically what I did with that 331 million example. If you know the literature, these are often called skeletons. Uh, Murray Cole invented the term in 1989. So please go and read that. OK, I've got a few slides just to show you. So Chris is going to come back to this this afternoon. We've built a skeleton library for Erlang as part of the, parallel, as part of the Paraphrase uh, project. Um, this is fully nestable, and it's available from the site. Essentially, what we say are things like, run this skeleton with these inputs. And they've got some abstract description of the skeleton structure, a map, a farm, whatever it happens to be. You'll see concrete examples this afternoon. Also, as I hinted, um, functions can deal with heterogeneity. Essentially, what we can say is, well, let's have two different types of processor, say CPUs and GPU. The scan is Haskell. And then what I can say is, well, I want the brick on the CPU to be, say, a par map. And if I'm running on a GPU, what I want to do is to use the GPU library uh, data.accelerate.map to do the same operation in parallel. The brick is the same. The parameter is different. Okay? So I've used higher order functions basically to choose between different types of operations, same API, same functionality. Great use of functional programming, in my mind. And then you can automatically choose in the runtime system between the CPU or the GPU. You can use cost information at runtime just to choose, do I run this on the CPU or the GPU? Simples. OK. Still some research to do there, of course. Vladimir will tell you about this this afternoon. He'll tell you about the Lapido framework uh, for hybrid skeletons. That extends the scale for Erlang with these kind of alternative choices for CPUs and GPUs. OK, so to conclude, the many core revolution is here. Computer hardware is changing more rapidly now than at any point in the last 50 years, roughly speaking. For the last 50 years, almost nothing happened in computer hardware. Things just got a bit faster. We had caches, better memories, and so on. Now, huge changes in the landscape of programming. Megacore is already here, also known as exascale programming for high-performance computing, or big data, if you're into that. So if you look at the data side, Megacore is used for really, really large-scale data manipulation. So very exciting, lots of money there. Heterogeneity and energy are both important. Most of the models, unfortunately, we have are far too low level. They're concurrency-based, and they don't expose the mass parallelism. But if you have patterns in functional programming, that's greatly going to aid the abstraction, means the threads easily controlled, easily scalable, and can deal with heterogeneity. So thank you, everyone. You may think this is a bit of wishful thinking. This is Phil Wadler and Hank Barendrecht in St. Andrews discussing this pensively. Rampant lambda men in St. Andrews, as my colleagues say. But no, C++ and Java and other languages are bringing functional programming to a language near you. Slowly, but we're getting there. So we now have closures, we have abstractions, uh, etc. Swift has first class, first class functions. All of these are exploitable. And we are, as I hinted at the start, actually taking these ideas about patterns, etc., and applying them in the C++ concept, context. We have uh, an Eclipse refactorer which uses these ideas. 
We do need you. Please join us. More of you, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think we have time for uh, several questions. Questions? I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the exascale, really, because you can't say that every problem is parallelizable, because I've written programs for hundreds of thousands of cores, and if the problem is not simple in a sense that it requires a lot of communication, you end up with all of your time spent on communication, not on the actual computation. So there still are problems, and probably many real-life problems are the ones that cannot be paralyzed to the exascale. Okay, so let, let me answer that. Um, so you're correct, there will be some problems that cannot be parallelized. But remember what I said about real dependencies and accidental dependencies. So if you're familiar, uh, so there's a law called Amdahl's law, which, which governs um, uh, performance. And basically what it says is um, when you've broken things down to the smallest possible unit, as I did with the, um, with the bricklayers, then fundamentally adding any more workers isn't going to get any faster. So you've already seen an illustration of that on a small scale. So you're quite right, there are some problems that won't break down. The question then is, can we find ways to break them down? Can we use tricks to eliminate some of these dependencies which appear to be essential, but actually in practice are not? And one of the tricks that we can use, especially in the functional programming context, is immutability replication. So one way to reduce communication is to, for example, replicate data. To do things multiple times, you may pay more computation cost, but you reduce communication cost. We need to keep that in balance, because you've correctly identified that in these large-scale systems, what matters partly is how much data you're shifting around the system. Also, if you're in a functional world, uh, these closures are great, because they are tiny bits of computation. Okay? So if you're trying to shift a big thread around the system, uh, no, a big Java lightweight thread, so so-called lightweight thread, then you're in trouble, because there's a huge amount of state that you've got to transfer. That's going to take a lot of time. With a functional language, you can send a closure. A closure basically has a small amount of data associated with it, you hope. It has computation associated with it. Um, if you're lucky, it's just a few bytes that have to be transmitted. You can send that much, much faster, much, much less cost. So yes, that exascale is going to be a challenge. It's something I've been thinking about, um, particularly in the Haskell and Scala context, something I would like to deal with. Uh, but I think we have some techniques that will help there. Questions? Hello, uh, great talk, by the way. Um, <laughs> could your talk not easily be, and you, you use the word yourself, uh, be generalized in the sense that you are um, uh, distinguishing instead of sequential and parallel compo uh, co composition, uh, uh, dependent and independent composition, because the, the sequential and parallel composition kind of uh, deals with latency, but you also have uh, other aspects like failure and stuff like that. And in my humble opinion, I think that the, the essence is indeed a, a dependent and independent com composition, and, and that <laughs> parallelism is just one aspect of it, and, uh, your systems will also have to cope with failure, and how do we deal with those things? And I, I guess that it's basically the same trick that can also say, like, am I going to fail fast? Am I going to uh, fail in another way? What's your comment on this? Yeah, so, so absolutely, in independence is the, is the key. Breaking dependencies is absolutely the key. Now, but you asked another question about failure modes, about recovery, etc. The nice thing if you have a purely functional computation is that it's stateless. Whenever I do it, it delivers the same result. So if my computation has failed, for example, because of machine failure, then I can just redo it anywhere, anytime, any place. So you have an automatic mechanism for dealing with hardware failure and recovery. I can also replicate the computations. Uh, so if I think something's going to fail, I can have many instances, and I just pick the ones that come back. They all deliver the same result doesn't matter if I'm wasting a bit of hardware. Okay? If you have state involved, then things are a bit harder. Generally speaking, I recommend that you don't. But if you do, then you have to 
do, uh, you need some other failure mechanism, so if computations deliver different results. Uh, you may need something like the Erlang approach, let things fail, uh, restart computations, re-inject re um, systems that have alternative ways of computing the same result, or even sometimes just drop the thing that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, not every computation actually matters. It's something we get a bit uh, worried about uh, in computer science. But in the Erlang community, telecoms community, they know they're going to drop a few calls. It doesn't matter if they drop occasional calls. They still want to drop all of the calls all the time. And that's what happens if you're too focused on dealing with all the computations. So sometimes the correct thing to do is to uh, drop some of the computations if you can get away with that. If you're a reliability metric, it's best to get away with that. Okay? It's better to upset a few cheap customers than a lot of expensive customers. No redundancy. Um, so logic programming um, is, is also great. Uh, I, quite, I like the way that uh, logic uh, deals with the uh, problem of program decomposition. If you have the right decomposition structure, you can easily do many things in parallel at the same time. Um, unfortunately, you don't have the same abstraction capability that you have in functional programming. So way back when I started my PhD, I actually started looking at logic programming initially. And I spent some time thinking about parallel programming in logic programming. I came to the conclusion that actually functional programming had a number of benefits, uh, both in terms of performance and in terms of the structuring capabilities. So yes, for the right applications, particularly if you're building a search type problem, uh, logic is great. Um, but for more general type problems, I think functional programming has an advantage. So I hope that's a good answer for you. Oh, if you can build higher order functions into logic, then that's also fantastic. <laughs> yes, the, unfortunately, there's still, there's still some issues uh, to date with performance. So they still don't have the same level of performance that you get with a functional program. So that's something that has to be tackled. It is much harder in the logic setting. Yeah, right. one, one question. Oh, uh, with, with Megacore, Will the pa parallelism be more important than, than concurrency? Yes. <laughs> uh, Would you like me to elaborate? <laughs> but fu fund fundamentally, uh, it's all about breaking the, pro the program down. If you need to keep a million cores active, you need to have a million threads. Okay. Concurrency doesn't really help with that because it gives the, although you have the illusion of multiple threads happening, what you're really doing is to build in some uh, dependency structure into your program. So the way that concurrency mechanisms typically deal with uh, multiple threads is to add in artificial dependencies to make sure that bad things don't happen. Okay. What you need to keep a million cores active is things really happening at the same time. These dependency structures get in the way. Okay. Blocks, etc. Transactions. Thank you very much, Kevin.